destiny. Putting away my book, I said to Kusum, what is this place we're going to? Why is it called Garjantola? Because of the Gajron tree, which grows in great abundance there. Oh, I had not made this connection. I thought that the name of the place came from the other meaning of the word Garjon, to roar. So it's not because of a tiger's cry? She laughed. Maybe that too. So why is it Garjantola we're going to? Why there and nowhere else? It's because of my father, Sa, Kusum said. Your father? Yes, once many years ago, his life was saved on this island. How? What happened? All right, Sar, since you asked, I'll tell you the story. I know you'll probably laugh. You won't believe me. It happened long, long before I was born. Fishing alone, my father was caught in a storm. The wind raged like a fiend and tore apart his boat. His hands fell on a log and somehow he stayed afloat. Swept by the current, he came to Gardentola. Climbing a tree, he tied himself with his gamcha. Attached to the trunk, he held on against the gales till suddenly the wind stopped and silence fell. The waves were quieted. The tree stood straight again, but there was no moon and not a thing could be seen. Now, in the dark of the night, he heard a garjon. Soon, he caught the smell of the unnameable one. Terror seized his heart and he lost all consciousness. He'd have fallen if the gamcha hadn't held him in place. He dreamed in his oblivion of Bon Bibi. Fool, she said. Don't be afraid. Believe in me. This place you have come to, I value it as my own. If you're good at heart, here you'll never be alone. When day breaks, you'll see it is time for low tide. Cross the island and go to the northern side. Keep your eyes on the water. Be patient and you'll see. You're not on your own. You're not far from me. You'll see my messengers, my ears and my eyes. They'll keep you company till the waters rise. Then... Will you know that deliverance is at hand? A boat will pass by and take you back to your land. Who could fail to be charmed by such a story so well told? I suppose you will tell me, I said smiling, that this was exactly how it happened? Why, yes, sir, it did. And afterwards, my father came back and built the shrine to Bon Bibi on the island. For the rest of his life, Every year we came here on this day, when it was time to do a puja for Bon Bibi. I laughed. And the messengers? I suppose you will say they were real too? Why, yes, sir, she said. They were, and even you will see them soon. Even I? I laughed louder still. An unbelieving secularist? I, too, am to be granted this privilege? Yes, sir. She persisted in the face of my skepticism. Anyone can see Bon Bibi's messengers if they know where to look. I took a little nap in the shade of my umbrella and then woke to the sound of Kusum's voice telling me we had arrived. I had been looking forward to the moment when I would be able to confound her credulousness. I sat quickly upright. It was low tide and we were becalmed in the stretch of still water. The shore was yet some distance away. There was nothing to be seen, no messengers, no any other d divine manifestation. I could not help preening myself a little as I savored my triumph. So where are they, Kusum? I said. These messengers of yours? Wait, sir. You'll see them. Suddenly there was a sound like that of a man blowing his nose. I turned around in astonishment to just in time to see a patch of black skin disappearing into the water. What was that? I cried. Where did it come from? Where did it go? Look, said little Fokir, pointing in the other direction. Over there. 
I turned to see another of these creatures rolling through the water. This time I also caught a glimpse of a small triangular fin. Although I had never before seen this animal, I knew it had to be a dolphin. Yet it was clearly not the shusuk I was accustomed to seeing in our waters, for those had no fins on their backs. What is it? I said. Is it some kind of shusuk? It was Kusum's turn to smile. I have my own name for them, she said. I call them Bonvivis Messengers. The triumph was hers now. I could not deny it to her. All the time our boat was at that spot, the creatures kept breaking the water around us. What held them there? What made them linger? I could not imagine. Then there came a moment when one of them broke the surface with its head and looked right at me. Now I saw why Kusum found it so easy to believe that these animals were something other than what they were. For where she had seen a sign of Bonbibi, I saw instead the gaze of the poet. It was as if he were saying to me, Some mute animal raising its calm eyes and seeing through us, and through us, this is destiny. The Mega In the morning, Pia and Kanai hired a cycle van to take them across the island to look at the Bhatpati Fakir had arranged. On the way, as they rattled down the brick-paved path that led to the village, Pia said, Tell me about the owner of this boat. Did you say you knew him? I met him when I came here as a boy, said Kanai. His name is Horan Naskor. I can't really claim to know him but he was close to my uncle. And what's his relation to Fokir? Oh, he's like an adopted parent, said Kanai. Fokir lived with him after his mother died. Horan was waiting at the foot of the embankment with Fokir at his side. Kanai recognized him at once. He was squat and wide-bodied, just as he remembered, but his chest seemed even broader now than before because of the substantial paunch that had burgeoned beneath it. With age, the folds of Horn's face had deepened so that his eyes seemed almost to have disappeared. Yet it was clear that the years had also added stature to his presence, for his demeanor was now that of a patriarch, a man who commanded the respect of all who knew him. His clothes, too, were those of a man of some means, his striped lungy was starched and carefully ironed, and his white shirt was spotlessly clean. On his wrist was a heavy watch with a metal strap, and sunglasses could be seen protruding from his shirt pocket. Do you remember me, Horinda? said Kanai, joining his hands in greeting. I am Sar's nephew. Of course, said Horan, matter-of-factly. You came here as a punishment in 1970. It was the year of the great Agumuka cyclone, but you left before that, I think. Yes, said Kanai. And how are your children? You had three then, I remember. They have grown children of their own now, said Horan. Look, there is one of them. Horan beckoned to a lanky teenager who was dressed in jeans and a smart blue t-shirt. His name is Nogan, and he's just out of school. He's going to be on our crew. Good, Kanai turned to introduce Pia. And this is the scientist who wants to hire the bot body, Shrimati Piali Roy. Horan bobbed his head in greeting to Pia. Come, he said, pulling up his lungy. My bot body is waiting. Following him up the embankment, Pia and Kanai saw that he was pointing to a vessel anchored off the sand pit that served as Lucy Barry's jetty. Painted in white lettering on its bow was the legend MV Mega. At first sight, there was little to recommend the vessel. It sat awkwardly in the water and its hull had the bruised and dented look of a tin toy, but Horan was proud of it and spoke of its merits at some length. The Mega had carried a great number of passengers, he said, to Kanai, and none had ever caused for complaint. He proceeded to recount many tales about the picnickers he had taken to Pakira Roy and the bridegrooms and Borjrachis he had ferried to weddings. 
These stories were not hard to believe, for despite its general decrepitude, the boat was clearly intended to cater to large, if huddled, numbers. The lower deck was a cavernous space crisscrossed with wooden benches and curtained with sheets of yellow tarpaulin. The galley and the engine room were located at opposite ends of this space. On top of this was a small upper deck with a wheelhouse and two tiny cabins. Over the stern hung a tin wall toilet. This was the head, and being little more than a hole in the floor, it was reasonably clean. She's not much to look at, Kanai admitted, but she might just be right for us. You and I could each have a cabin on the upper deck, and that would keep us away from the noise and fumes. And what about Fokir? said Thea. He'd be on the lower deck said Kanai, along with Horin and the helper he's bringing with him, his 15-year-old grandson, I believe. Is that going to be the whole crew, said Pia, just the two of them? Yes, said Kanai, we're not going to be crowded for space. Pia gave the mega a doubtful look. It isn't the research ship of my dreams, she said, but I could live with it, except for one thing. What's that? I don't get how this old tub is going to follow the dolphins. I can't see it going into all those shallow creeks. Kanai relayed Pia's question to Horan and then translated the answer for her benefit. Fokir's boat would be accompanying them on the journey. The mega would tow it all the way and on reaching their destination, the Badwati would stay at anchor while Pia and Fokir tracked the dolphins in the boat. Really? This was what Pia had been hoping to hear. I guess Fakir was ahead of me on this one. What do you think? said Kanai. Will it work? Yes, said Pia. It's a great idea. It'll be much easier to follow the dolphins in his boat. With Kanai translating, the Bodbati's terms were quickly agreed upon. Although Pia would not allow Kanai to contribute to the rental, she agreed to split the cost of the journey's provisions. They handed over a sum of money for Horan to buy rice, dal, oil, tea, bottled water, a couple of chickens, and specifically for Pia, a plentiful supply of powdered milk. It's so exciting, said Pia as they headed back to the guest house. I can't wait to leave. I'd better get all my washing done this morning. And I'd better go and tell my aunt I'm going to be away for a couple of days, said Kanai. I don't know how sh she's going to take it. Nilema's door was open and Kanai entered to find her sitting at her desk sipping a cup of tea. Her smile of greeting turned quickly into a curious frown. What's the matter, Rekanai? Is something wrong? No, there's nothing wrong, said Kanai awkwardly. I just wanted to tell you, Mashima, that I'm going to be away for a few days. You're going away, she said, but you've only just come. I know, said Kanai. I hope you won't mind, but Pia's hired a pot body to track her dolphins. She needs someone to translate. Oh, I see, said Nilema in English, drawing out the words. So you are going with her then? Knowing how precious Nirmala's memory was to her, Kanai said gently, and I thought I would take the notebook along with me, if that's all right with you. You'll be careful with it, won't you? Yes, of course. How much have you read? I'm well into it, said Kanai. I'll be done by the time I get back. All right then, I won't ask you any more about it now, Nilima said. But tell me this, Kanai, where exactly are you going? Kanai scratched his head. The fact was he didn't know and had not thought to ask, but a habitual unwillingness to acknowledge ignorance led him to pick the name of a river at random. I think we'll be going down to the Tarabaki River, into the forest. 
So you're heading into the jungle, said Nelima, looking him over speculatively, speculatively. I suppose so, Kanai said uncertainly. Nelima rose from her desk and came to stand in front of him. Kanai, I hope you've thought this over properly. Yes, of course I have, said Kanai, feeling suddenly like a schoolboy. No, I don't think you have, Kanai, said Nelima, with her hands on her hips. And I don't blame you. I know that for outsiders, it's very hard to conceive of the dangers. The tigers, you mean? Kanai said. A smile lifted the corners of his lips. Why would a tiger pick me when it could have a tasty young morsel like Pia? Kanai, scolded Nilima. This is not a joke. I know that in this day and age, in the 21st century, it's difficult for you to imagine yourself being attacked by a tiger. The trouble is that over here it's not the least bit of out of the ordinary. It happens several times each week. As often as that, said Kanai. Yes, more, said Nelima. Look, I'll show you something. She took hold of Kanai's elbow and led him across the room to one of the many stacks of shelves that lined the walls. Look, she said, pointing to a sheaf of files. I've been keeping unofficial records for years based on word of mouth reports. My belief is that over a hundred people are killed by tig tigers here each year. And mind you, I'm just talking about the Indian part of the Sundarbans. If you include the Bangladesh side, the figure is probably twice that. If you put the figures together, it means that a human being is killed by a tiger every other day in the Sundarbans. At the very least. Can I raise his eyebrows? I knew there were killings, he said, but I never thought there were as many as that. That's the trouble, said Nilima. Nobody knows exactly how many killings there are. None of the figures are reliable, but of this I'm sure. There are many more deaths than the authorities admit. Can I scratch his head? This must be a recent trend, he said. Perhaps it has something to do with overpopulation or encroach encroachment on the habitat or something like that. Don't you believe it, Nilima said scornfully. These attacks have been going on for centuries. They were happening even when the population here was a fraction of what it is today. Look. Standing on tiptoe, she pulled a file off a shelf and carried it to her desk. Look over here. Do you see that number? Can I look down at the page and saw that the tip of her finger was pointing to an, a numeral? 4,218. Look at that figure, can I? Elima said. That's the number of people who are killed by tigers in Lower Bengal in a six-year period between the years 1860 and 1866. The figures were compiled by J. Fire, who was an English nationalist who coined the phrase Royal Bengal Tiger. Think of it, Kanai, over 4,000 human beings killed. That's almost two people every day for six years. What would the number add up to over a century? Tens of thousands. Kanai frowned as he looked down at the page. It's hard to believe. Unfortunately, said Nilima. It's all too true. And why do you think this happens this way? Kanai said. What's behind this? Nilima sat at her desk and sighed. I've heard so many the theories, Kanai. I just wish I knew which to believe. The one thing every everyone agreed on, Nilima said, was that the Thai country's tigers were different from those elsewhere. In other habitats, tigers attacked human beings only in abnormal circumstances, if they happened to be crippled or were otherwise unable to hunt down any other kind of prey. But this was not true of the Thai country's tigers. Even young and healthy animals were known to attack human beings. Some said that this propensity came from the peculiar conditions of the tidal ecology in which large parts of the forest were subjected to daily submersions. The theory went that this raised the animal's threshold of aggression by washing away their sense markings and confusing their ter territorial instincts. This was about as convincing a theory as Nelma had ever heard, but the trouble was that even if it was true, there was nothing that could be done about it. 
With every few years came some new theory and some yet more ingenious solution. In the 1980s, a German naturalist had suggested that the tiger's preference for human flesh was somehow connected with the shortage of fresh water in the Sunderbans. This idea had been received with great enthusiasm by the forest department and several pools had been excavated to provide the tigers with fresh water. Just imagine that, said Nilima. They were providing water for tigers in a place where nobody thinks twice about human beings going thirsty. The digging was in vain, however. The pools had made no difference. The attacks continued as before. Then there was the electric shock idea, said Nilima, with laughter shining in her eyes. Someone had decided that the tigers could be conditioned with the methods Pavlov had used on his dogs. Clay models of human beings had been rigged, rigged up with wires and connected to car batteries. These contraptions were distributed all over the islands. For a while they seemed to be working and there was much jubilation. But then the attack started again. The tigers just ignored the clay models and carried on as before. Another time, a forester came up with another equally ingenious idea. What if people wore masks on the backs of their heads? Tigers always attacked humans from behind. The reasoning went so they would shy away if they found themselves looking at a pair of painted eyes. This idea too was taken up with great enthusiasm. Many masks were made and distributed. Word was put out that a wonderful new experiment was being tried in the Sunderbands. There was something so picturesque about the idea that it caught the public imagination. Television cameras descended. Filmmakers made films. The tiger, alas, refused to cooperate. Evidently, they had no difficulty in discriminating between masks and faces. So, are you saying the tigers are actually able to think these things through? Said Kanai. I don't know, Kanai, Nilima said. I've lived here for over 50 years and I've never seen a tiger. Nor do I want to. I've come to believe what people say in these parts, that if you see a tiger, the chances are you won't live to tell the tale. That's why I'm telling you, Kanai, you can't go into the jungle on a whim. Before you go, you should ask yourself whether you really need to. But I'm not planning to go into the jungle at all, Kanai replied. I'm going to be on the barge party, well removed from any harm. And you think a butt party is going to keep you from harm? We'll be out on the water, well away from shore. What can happen there? Can I let me tell you something? Nine years ago, a tiger killed a young girl, right here in Lucy Bari. They found later that it had swum all the way across the Bidyas Mahona and back again. Do you know how far that is? No. Six kilometers each way. And that's not unusual. They've been known to swim as much as 13 kilometers at a stretch. So don't for a moment imagine that the water will give you any safety. Boats and butt parties are attacked all the time, even out in midstream. It happens several times each year. Really? Yes, Nilima nodded. And if you don't believe me, just take a close look at any of the forest department's boats. You'll see they're like floating fortresses. Their windows have steel bars as thick as my wrist, and that's despite the fact that forest guards carry arms. Tell me, does your butt body have bars on its windows? Can I scratch his head? I don't remember. There you are, Nilima said. You didn't even notice. I don't think you understand what you're getting into. Leave aside the animals. Those boats and butt bodies are more dangerous than anything in the jungle. Every month we hear of one or two going down. There's no reason for you to worry, said Kanai. I won't take any risks. But Kanai, don't you see? To our way of thinking, you are the risk. The others are going because they need to. But not you. You're going on a whim. A kayal. You don't have any pressing reason to go. That's not true. I do have a reason. Kanai had spoken without thinking and cut himself off in mid-sentence. Kanai? said Nilima. Is there something you aren't telling me? Oh, it's just... He could not think of what to say next and hung his head. She looked at him shrewdly. It's that girl, isn't it? Pia? 
Kanai looked away in silence and she said with a bitterness he had never heard in her voice, You are all the same, you men. Who can blame the tigers when predators like you pass for human beings? She took hold of Kanai's elbow and led him to the door. Be careful, Kanai. Just be careful.